Good evening, everybody. We're excited to have you here tonight. My name is Mike Hopper with HBO Corporate Affairs, and on behalf of the LBJ Library and HBO, uh, we'd like to welcome you to tonight's special presentation of Which Way is the Front Line from Here? The Life and Time of Tim Hetherington. Uh, we're really excited to be able to present this film for you. Uh, we're honored to have the film's director here tonight, so we hope that you can stay with us. There's going to be a great discussion after the film. Um, and just want to say a quick thank you to the LBJ Library for partnering with us. Um, they give us an opportunity to get in front of you people, and, and you're our cheerleaders for, for films like this. So I want to thank them for that. Um, at this time, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, if you would, please join me in welcoming the director of the LBJ Library, Mr. Mark Updegrove. Thank you, Mike. I want to offer a special welcome to those members of our audience who have served in the military or who are currently serving in the military. We appreciate you being here and we appreciate your service to our nation. The LBJ Library has had a long-standing partnership with HBO. In the past several years alone, we've collaborated with them on screenings for Path to War, Game Change, Defense, and Thurgood. Tonight, HBO and renowned war correspondent, author, and director Sebastian Younger bring us a first look at the documentary, Which Way is the Front Line from Here? The Life and Time of Tim Hetherington. The film will air on HBO on April 18th and follows Younger's close friend, photojournalist, and fellow filmmaker, Tim Hetherington, who was killed in the Civil War in Libya just two years ago. Younger is best known for his, uh, as the works of, uh, that include The Perfect Storm, A Death in Belmont, and War. And his work in tonight's documentary is in keeping with the thoughtful, provocative films produced by HBO. Following the credits, Sebastian and I will have a conversation about this very powerful film. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sebastian Younger. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here in such a beautiful city. Um, any film is a collaboration by many people, unlike a book. I usually write books, but films are collaborations, and there's no way to make a good film without many good people involved. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to go through them by name, um, because most of the names it won't be meaningful to you, but I just want to say I had an incredible team, and I do want to thank HBO for a really wonderful partnership in making this film. Um, they decided within about 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, in a conversation that this was a film they wanted to support and they've been an amazing partner ever since. So I do, I do want to recognize them. Uh, the film is about my good friend, Tim Hetherington. We went through a lot of good times and a lot of hard times together in Afghanistan and later. Uh, we made Restrepo, and we rode it all the way to the Oscars. Uh, we watched in sort of puzzlement as the Arab Spring just exploded while we were on red carpets in Los Angeles, feeling quite out of place, and we decided we had to um, rush overseas to continue covering these important stories. At the last minute, I couldn't go. Tim went on his own, and he was killed. Um, he went from being an Oscar-nominated director to Dead in Combat in six weeks, which is, has probably never been done before, and I hope it's never done again. Um, he was a good friend. He was a brother. He was 10 years younger than me, and I learned an enormous amount from him. I hope he learned from me, too, but I know I learned an awful lot from him. He was, very, um, he was incredibly brave on the battlefield and off. Uh, as a photographer, as an artist, he was really sort of intrepid and daring. Um, he was incredibly curious about the world, and I would watch him just talk to people anywhere. I mean, it could be a, an Afghan, you know, an Afghan villager or a soldier, or it could be a, 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 a taxi driver in, in New York. He was just curious about the world, and he had just an endless sort of reservoir of compassion for what I came to think of as the, um, the um, sort of quiet dignity of the human struggle. He was very, very attuned to that. And when he took photographs, what he was really doing was connecting to people. The photograph was kind of an afterthought, in a sense. What he really wanted was connection, and he got it over and over again. 
I learned a lot from him. I wanted to make a film that would allow other people to learn from him as well, even though he's no longer with, with us. So thank you, and I look forward to talking to you afterwards. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome again Sebastian Younger. I'll, I'll sit on the far side. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, congratulations. That's very, very powerful. Thank you very That's much. Excellent film. Uh, how did you come to know Tim Hetherington? I, I'd worked for Vanity Fair for many years, mostly covering wars, and I had this project of following a platoon for one year in combat, and they okayed it. I wanted, on the, so I was on assignment for them, but I wanted to write a book and make a documentary film, and I started that. I was, I um, took one trip, shot a lot of video. I was with a photographer who just didn't work out that well, and so Vanity Fair suggested some other names. One of them was Tim. I knew his work from Liberia because I'd been in the Liberian Civil War when he was there, except I was on the other side with the government and had an equally miserable time. And, um, and so I knew he was you know, good in combat. And when I talked to him on the phone, I said, look, the stuff they're doing out there, the American soldiers, is physically really, really hard. So you have to be in really good shape. Are you in good shape? And he said, well, uh, when you meet me, you'll realize I'm rather lean. And in Typical British understatement. And um, so on my second trip, I started working with Tim, and then he kind of fell in love with the project as well. He started shooting video, and we just started alternating trips. You had been on the front lines uh, many times earlier, and you'd known a lot of war correspondents. What made him unique? We heard a little bit about that in the film, but in your view, what made him unique? He, I mean, he was very brave, and he was also quite cautious, cautious which don't always go together. Um, and he also, he was not interested in war. He was really interested in people and what happens to people in war. It's very, e combat is very dramatic and it's very easy to get distracted by the sort of like repetitive drama of combat and just take a lot of photographs of guys shooting guns. And that's actually not that interesting. And Tim sort of saw through that. And what he was really interested in was the human drama that plays out in war in such an intense form um, between men in the, in the platoon, between, you know, in, in refugee populations, wh whoever it may be, that's what interested him. And that made him quite different from a lot of combat photographers. He, the, the film talks a little bit, he talks a little bit in the film about his destructive tendencies and he took up photography, I, I think, to, in order to alleviate those. But uh, in a way, you have to have destructive tendencies to go into a war zone. I wonder, how do you overcome your fear of death when you go into a, a war? I, I think some people do go to war for self-destructive reasons. I don't mm -hmm. think Tim was. I mean, he was referring to his 20s when he, I don't know, how should I put this? He, he, had a, he enjoyed his 20s quite a bit. <laughs> and I think eventually he realized he had to kind of grow up and focus, and he right. did brilliantly. Um, how do you deal with your fear of death? Um, I mean, how do any of us deal with our fear of death, you know? like. Nothing happens in combat that doesn't happen to everybody eventually. So but you're not seeing it every day. I mean, when I go out every day, I'm not, I'm not faced with my own mortality as you are when you're in a foxhole or right. on the front lines. It's, I mean, in a sense, yes. In a sense, no. In a sense, you're just choosing not to think about it. Right. And, and in a war, um, I mean, what happens with me, and I think it's pretty common, um, there's kind of a switch, and you're worried, and you're worried, and you're worried, and then there's a point where I was always particularly fearful before patrols, uh, you know, or um, uh, you know, like multi-day operations that were going to go might go badly. Like it was in the lead-up that I was particularly anxious, and there was always a point where you have to jump out of the helicopter. You gotta whatever. There's always a moment where whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And when you cross that threshold, it's actually kind of a relief, and you stop being scared. It's a kind of denial and a kind of uh, fatalism. And I, I, I recognize it in combat because I, you know, I was a climber for tree companies. I took, I would, all through my, tw you know, starting my mid, late 20s, I started working for tree companies taking trees down. So I'd be 80 feet in the air with a chainsaw and a rope taking down big sections of tree, you know, complicated, dangerous job. And there was always a point where 
if you're topping out a big tree, it, if you don't cut it right, it can go quite badly for you. And there's a mo you do the front cut, and there's a moment where you start the back cut, and you're setting in motion a process that you can't stop. And the act of turning on the saw and starting the back cut is, was always very hard for me. And I would get to myself to a place where I didn't care about the outcome. And I found that a sort of, I would, a kind of empty, empty feeling. And I recognized that in combat. And then other soldiers I talked to also said, like, that's, ex it's an emptiness and that you can achieve. And I think all of us deal with it that way. It, do you need that psychology in war? Yeah. You do? Yeah. I mean, if you're focused on what can happen to you, if you care what can happen to you, there are moments where you won't be able to function. And yet you said when you left the war zone, when you left the platoon you were with, you missed it. H how so? Well, I mean, those, those things that you're doing are very, um, they're very dramatic and meaningful. They have enormous consequences. And as a journalist, you do feel like you are providing this crucial role of telling the world what's happening in it. You know, that's, you know, that's, that can be pretty intoxicating to be in that role. It feels very important. And in addition, um, the relations between people in situations like that are very intense and, and kind of unbounded. And that also is, is quite intoxicating. And I think when, I mean, a lot of the soldiers we were with really missed the war. Um, and what they were missing, I think, wasn't the killing and the risks and the bloodshed. It was the connection that they all had, it's, which you really can't reproduce in civilian life, and they missed it. Um, one, of the, one of the guys, a guy named Brendan, said to me, you know, there's guys in the platoon who straight up hate each other, but we'd all die for each other. Right. That you can't reproduce back home, and they really miss it. Right. You chose not to be a war correspondent any longer. Why? Well, I found out about Tim, um, and uh, within about an hour, I was in shock, right? And I, I found out on Twitter, someone called me and said, Tim might have been hurt in Libya, and I didn't know what to do, so I searched his name on Twitter. And Twitter is so e sort of ephemeral and insubstantial, and death is so much the opposite of those two things. And the, I, finding out about the death of a friend on Twitter is like, I hope that never happens to me again. But um, with, I, sort of, I went into shock, you know, and um, within about an hour, I just made the decision I wasn't going to cover war anymore. I, um, I, you know, I had two or three really close calls, and, but more importantly, I, um, I sort of sensed this tidal wave of grief that was coming towards everybody about Tim, and everyone who cared about Tim, there was this just dark tidal wave of, of grief coming. It hadn't really hit yet, right? We were all in shock. And I just, I was like, this is going to be awful for a long time. And I just had the feeling that I didn't want to put the people I love through that kind of tidal wave. Like, there's a point in your life, you know, not at 25, not at 30, but there's a point in your life where you have to stop gambling with other people's lives. And when you lose your life in combat, it doesn't really matter to you. You're actually gambling with everyone else's emotional life. You and Tim saw the war in Afghanistan, as, as few have. In your view, have our efforts in Afghanistan been worth the sacrifice in blood and treasure? That's, a, I mean, I don't know how to evaluate the, what you trade a human life for, so it's hard to answer the question, worth it. But let me, as a friend of mine said, journalists don't tell you what to think, they tell you what to think about. And so let me answer it in that context. Um, the we would not have killed bin Laden without being in Afghanistan, like period, end of sentence. You're not gonna fly SEAL Team 6 from Virginia into Pakistan, into Afghanistan to kill him and get out. Uh, we could not have destroyed Al-Qaeda without being there. Um, on the other side of the equation, uh, and we haven't been attacked in um, 12 years, almost 12 years, and there have been many, many attempts, and I think one of the effects of being in Afghanistan is we really degraded al-Qaeda's capabilities. I was completely against Iraq. Iraq was, like, I, I refused to cover it. I was so against it. In Afghanistan, I, I thought it was um, necessary and it might protect us, but also I'd been covering Afghanistan since the mid-90s. I really cared about Afghanistan a lot. And, you know, my first trip there in 96, I never imagined the U.S. would be involved militarily in that country. 
And after 9-11, the Afghans were so grateful. I mean, I was there when Kabul fell, when the Taliban were driven out of Kabul, and I was getting hugged by Afghans on the street because they were so grateful that America had kicked out the Taliban. And that country, I don't know what is in the future, none of us do, obviously, but that country is so much better off right now. And it's also the lowest level of civilian casualties in 30 years because of NATO security forces. So is it worth it or not? That I can't answer, but those are the things that happened because we were there. Uh, Afghanistan has been called the graveyard of empires. Can we establish democracy in that part of the world, in your view? I think it, the... the um, what we, can, what we have helped establish there is as much a democracy as in many allied countries like Pakistan, Mexico. I mean, we do business with many, many countries that have a very, very funky system. <laughs> you know, and Afghanistan's gonna be one of them. I think, you know, it's not gonna be Wisconsin. You know, I mean, that's not realistic for that area of the world. Right. Um, but um, I think if we can, put it into the realm of many other countries that we take seriously, who are participate in, in the community of nations. I mean, yeah, I think it's possible. As a result of Tim's death, you were the catalyst for a medical training program for freelance journalists. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, Tim, as you saw in the film, he was hit by shrapnel and um, he bled out. He, he was not necessarily a mortal wound. Chris Hondros was hit in the head with shrapnel. That was a mortal wound, although it took him a while to die. Uh, Tim just bled out over the course of four or five minutes. Um, and none of the freelancers around him knew what to do. None of them had any medical training. And so when I found that out, I decided to start a, a and I, I haven't had any medical training and neither had Tim, you know. Mm -hmm. And freelancers do probably 90% of the frontline reporting and they, are, they have no training. And uh, so I started a group called Reporters Instructed in Saving Colleagues, RISC. R-I-S-C, uh, risktraining.org is the website. And we're a nonprofit, and we, we provide uh, four days in a hotel in New York, a four-day training session, and a medical kit uh, for experienced freelance war reporters. We've just finished our third session. We, so thus far, we've trained up 72 people. Um, and, uh, you know, 28 journalists have been killed in Syria alone. This is a very dire situation, people are dying, and so we're training as fast as we can the real frontline troops of the journalism world um, so that if another Tim happens, and I'm, unfortunately it's entirely likely, uh, that people might have the equipment and the knowledge to help treat them. Have you seen any success from the program to, to this point? Uh, oh, no one has saved the life yet, yeah. and uh, I mean in some ways, thank God, you know, like uh, I, you know, like if they never have to use it, that's, that's entirely a good right. thing. Although. One of them was at home, and this elderly gentleman fell down some stairs and was very badly hurt, and he sort of rendered aid. So, you know, it's just like, it's uh, maybe they'll never have to use it, I don't know. But they, the deal I have with them is, once we, it's entirely free, they just have to get to New York, right? And I said, once we train you and give you a medical kit, you have to commit to always having that medical kit on you in combat. You can't leave it in the car, you can't leave it at the hotel room. Um, and um, so, and they're doing that. And they send back photos of them in Afghanistan and Syria and wherever else. And there's our little medical kit, and it's pretty cool. And if you're feeling generous, um, please check out the website, risktraining.org. Uh, you know, we're doing this 20 bucks at a time, but we are getting it done. That's great. This airs, I mentioned to the audience, uh, on the 18th of this month on HBO. What do you hope audiences derive from this film? Well, a few things. I mean, I just want to remember and honor my friend Tim, mm. and I wanted to make a film that would allow other people to be affected by him and his work now that he's no long, longer around to do that in person. Um, I also wanted to continue a little bit of the topic that he was sort of in, intrigued by. What, why is war so captivating to young men? Like, why are young men drawn to war, to combat? And you can see it in Liberia, you can see it in North Africa, you can see it among American, you know, American soldiers. It, it, like, what is it they're drawn to and what are the consequences of it? Uh, it's a very politically incorrect thing to say, but it's the truth of the matter. And I feel like we really don't have a chance of reducing the level of violence in the world until we understand why violence, among other things, is compelling. And I, I sometimes do this with audiences, I'll, I'll say, 
you know, who here is horrified by war? And of course, you know, everyone raises their hand. And, and, and then I'll say, okay, you're all horrified by war. Who here has paid $12 to be entertained by a Hollywood war movie? Just about everyone raises their hand. So war, we have a ve even completely compassionate, sensitive people have, are interested in war. It's a very, very compelling thing, and we have to unpack that in order to have a chance at stopping it. I think particularly young men have romantic images of what war might be in some respects. Uh, so what, was, uh, what most surprised you about war when you were exposed to it for the first time? I was surprised by how mundane it was. You know, like my first war was in Bosnia. And you sort of picture war, you know, in what, you know, what you've seen in Hollywood war movies, but it's, act, you know, like a lot of normal life goes on in war. I mean, if there's a civilian population, and I don't mean, you know, D-Day, but, you know, Bosnia and Sarajevo, you know, I remember having dinner. It was a beautiful summer evening, and um, we were having dinner outside in a, in a suburb of Sarajevo called Dobrinja. And it was a real frontline situation. And we were having dinner outside with this family that we knew. Lovely, soft summer evening. And meanwhile, like, tracer rounds were just streaming down the street, you know, like, about 15 feet away. And we were safe because we were behind the building. We were just watching these things go by. We were completely safe. And it was normal life, family having dinner and tracer fire going on, you know, like, simultaneously. That really surprised me. You were t you, I read an interview where you were talking about... Uh uh, w one of the people in the, one of the uh, uh, members of the military that you were with and during a particularly mundane time, and he said, man, I hope we get attacked today. Did yeah. that happen often? Did, 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 did they want to engage? Did they, did, uh, uh, did, does your adrenaline sort of pump, and do you want to get into the fight? Well, you have to understand, like, out at Restrepo, there, everything else was taken away. Yeah. You know, there was no internet, there was no phone, there was no television, there was no girls, there was nothing, there was no sports, there was nothing that young men like. Yeah. And kind of the only compelling thing to do out there was fight. And the fighting happened when the enemy attacked, for the most part. And so you were kind of at their mercy. And if they wanted to just bore you to death for three weeks, they could do that. You know? And, and it drove the guys crazy. And, and they just be, would be moping around like, God, can we be attacked? Please. So, you know, and, you know, and being attacked at an outpost, I mean, you can get killed at an outpost, absolutely. And we, you know, there were some real fears of being overrun, actually. It was a very small position, you know, and, and uh, but that is very, very different from being ambushed in the open. Like, no one, no one wished for that. That's really scary. Do you keep in touch with those guys that, that uh, you were with at Restrepo? Some of them, yeah. I mean, I was closer to some than others. Um, some I hear from once a year, some I hear from once a week. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're a storyteller who's comfortable with the written word and, and uh, with film. W what's your next project? I'm doing another film for HBO, and I'm writing another book on the same topic, like War and Restrepo. Um, but it's a, I can't tell you the details. It's a little bit secret. It's, 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 it's a tiny bit illegal. <laughs> Not immoral, but a tiny bit illegal. Well, we hope you'll, uh, you'll come back and share that with us as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please join me in, in thanking our guest, Sebastian Yoder. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.